These days, stores and restaurants often provide detailed information about the gluten content of their products, and many offer gluten-free alternatives. Does that mean gluten is bad for you? It is, if your body thinks it is. We've all heard of gluten, but what actually is it? Since we associate it with bread, you might think it's a carbohydrate, but it's actually a protein. Plants don't need much to grow, but they do rely on stored resources in order to germinate. Gluten is a storage protein found in grain, in particular the brow grains, barley, rye, oats, and wheat. These plants are closely related to each other, but are only distantly related to grains such as rice that do not cause celiac disease. Actually, oats fall somewhere in between and are much better tolerated. But the problem is oats are often contaminated with other grains during processing. Glutens help to protect and hydrate seeds and are used as a source of energy, nitrogen, and amino acids. From a materials perspective, gluten has fantastic properties, including both viscosity and elasticity, making it ideal for baking. It's also used as an emulsifier, a thickening agent, a binding agent, a stabilizer, and a source of protein, improving the flavor, shelf life, and nutritional content of numerous products. It sounds almost too good to be true. So what's the catch? The catch is that gluten is remarkably hard to digest. We're accustomed to this for complex carbohydrates like cellulose that we know we don't have the enzymes to digest. But frankly, we're pretty good at breaking down proteins. Hydrochloric acid in the stomach helps proteins unfold into more relaxed forms that are easier for enzymes to access. The low pH also converts pepsinogen to pepsin which in turn cleaves proteins into smaller fragments by breaking the N-terminal peptide bonds next to phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, and leucine. When food enters the duodenum, the pancreas releases a number of other proteases and peptidases that continue to break down proteins into individual amino acids for absorption. Trypsin cleaves C-terminal bonds next to lysine and arginine, while elastase cleaves C-terminal bonds next to glycine, alanine, and valine. Other proteases cleave amino acids from the ends of peptides. Carboxypeptidases cleave C-terminal amino acids, while aminopeptidases cleave N-terminal amino acids. Finally, brush border dipeptidases and tripeptidases break down any remaining dipeptides and tripeptides. And it's the end of this process. Strictly speaking, gluten consists of two different proteins, gliadin and glutenin. And gliadin is the troublemaker. Gliadin is a prolamin, a group of hydrophobic proline and glutamine-rich plant storage proteins form rigid, tightly linked structures. As you might expect, plants have specialized enzymes, such as glutenase and papain-like cysteine proteases, that we lack. We do have enzymes such as prolyl endopeptidase that can cleave proline-rich sequences, but steric hindrance makes it difficult for proteolytic enzymes to cleave the bonds efficiently. Therefore, large, undigested, proline-rich fragments tend to remain in the digestive tract, including a specific 33-mark peptide. Well, why is that a problem? The lumen of the digestive tract is still technically outside of the body. However, the small intestine contains several features that greatly increase the surface area, including plicae circularis, villi, and microvilli, which constitute an enormous interface exposed to the outside world. Enterocytes are continuously produced through stem cell division in the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Cells migrate along the surface of the villi and are sloughed off after several days. Cells are tightly bound to each other by tight junctions, and the mucosa is protected by resident lymphocytes. Brush border enzymes efficiently break down ingested nutrients, which are then absorbed by specialized receptors and pass into the portal circulation. And then, disaster. In a genetically susceptible individual, a small amount of gluten is enough to wreak havoc in this delicate microenvironment. The tight junctions form an impenetrable barrier, but tight junctions are dynamic structures and can be unlocked. And the key is onulin. Gliadin binds to chemokine receptor CXCR3 on enterocytes, which triggers an intracellular signaling cascade that leads to the release of zonulin into the extracellular space. Binding of zonulin to the zonulin receptor turns the key and activates an intracellular cascade. Tight junctions are disassembled and gliadin and other large molecules pass through the epithelial barrier into the lamina propria. Once inside this inner sanctum, gluten finally encounters an enzyme capable of efficiently targeting it. Tissue glantaminase normally plays an important role in wound healing by cross-linking glutamine and lysine residues in the extracellular matrix. When it encounters gliadin, tissue transglutaminase deaminates the peptide as usual, converting glutamine into glutamic acid. Unfortunately, this converts gliadin into a much more immunogenic form. 
In susceptible individuals, tissue transglutaminase kicks off an immunologic chain reaction that destroys the architecture of the duodenum and proximal jejunum of the small intestine. The immune system constantly patrols the body looking for foreign antigens. The MHC class 1 system is an introspective system in which nearly all cells display fragments of intracellular proteins on the surface for inspection by CD8 plus T cells. Abnormal or infected cells are quickly destroyed. Conversely, the elite MHC class 2 system is found only in immune surveillance cells, which scour the extracellular space looking for intruders. When an antigen presenting cell encounters a suspicious molecule such as gliadin, it engulfs the protein and displays it on the cell surface as part of the MHC class 2 complex. In most individuals, the immune system is generally tolerant of dietary proteins such as gliadin and does not mount a strong response. However, the conversion of glutamine residues to glutamic acid instigated by tissue transglutaminase strengthens the binding affinity of gliadin to two specific HLA alleles, HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. CD4 plus T cells recognize this high affinity signature and roar into action. T cells proliferate and release pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor alpha. The robust immune response compromises the integrity of the epithelial barrier even further, allowing even more gliadin to enter and amplifying the response. In response to gluten exposure, stressed enterocytes call for help by expressing the non-classical MHC class 1 markers MIK-A and MIK-B. Stressed enterocytes and activated T cells stimulate epithelial cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells to release IL-15, which further amplifies the immune response by upregulating pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. IL-15 also promotes the expression of NKG2D receptors on resident immune cells called intraepithelial lymphocytes, or IELs. This receptor binds to the stress markers MIK-A and MIK-B, activating the cytotoxic IELs. This call for help was not meant to save the cell, but rather protect the cells around it. IELs trigger apoptosis through FAS and FAS cell signaling and directly kill the cell by injecting perforins and cranzones. CD4 plus T cells also induce B cells to differentiate into plasma cells and release antibodies against both gliadin and tissue transglutaminase. Because tissue transglutaminase is also found in muscle fibers, anti-endomysial antibodies are also produced as a result of epitope spreading. These antibodies are highly specific to celiac disease and are often used in diagnostic testing. Antibodies may also develop against targets outside of the small intestine. For example, antibodies against epidermal transglutaminase in the skin causes dermatitis herpetiformis. The collateral damage from this autoimmune blitz is enormous, altering the structure of the small intestine in three characteristic ways. First, the villi atrophy, greatly reducing the surface area of the small intestine. Instead of their normal columnar shape, enterocytes appear cuboidal or squamous, with fewer and shorter microvilli and intracellular changes suggesting that cells are functionally compromised. At the same time, cell division in the crypts increases up to six-fold to replace damaged cells, leading to crypt hyperplasia and premature shedding. Third, the proportion of intraepithelial immune cells in the crypts greatly increases. Clearly, damage to the small intestine can have severe consequences, but the presentation of celiac disease is highly variable with over 200 associated symptoms. The word celiac comes from the Greek word for belly and doesn't go far in describing the disease, but celiac disease is also known as gluten-sensitive enteropathy and celiac sprue. Now, sprue is an old term for a malabsorption disorder of the small intestine. The osmotic potential of the intestine is carefully balanced, so when there's a large amount of material remaining in the intestine, it causes excess water to enter the lumen, resulting in diarrhea. Other major symptoms of celiac disease include bloating, fatigue, abdominal pain, satyria, weight loss, and lactose intolerance. These symptoms definitely affect quality of life, but the most serious symptoms are those associated with dehydration and malabsorption, which can result in deficiencies in iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12. This can lead to anemia, failure to thrive, delayed puberty, osteoporosis, peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, depression, joint pain, and infertility. Chronic inflammation is also a general risk factor for cancer, and continuous damage to the intestinal lining drives rapid turnover of enterocytes, increasing the risk of mutations. In particular, celiac disease is associated with a higher incidence of rare cancers, such as enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, 
and, and then of course an animal of the small intestine. What's the treatment for this severe autoimmune condition? Well, the definitive treatment is the complete removal of gluten from the diet. So should you stop eating gluten? Well, that's a discussion you should have with your doctor. The question is not whether gluten is good or bad per se, but whether your immune system tolerates it or not. But the good news is that a strict gluten-free diet is highly effective in treating celiac disease. In the absence of gluten, the epithelial barrier repairs itself and villi begin to reform. Eventually, the symptoms subside and the architecture of the small intestine is restored.